Oh, OK. So if you're seeing this, Aunt Matilda, great to see you. <laughs> the, um, so it's a Camino. This is the Camino de Santiago. It is about 1,200 years. Some of the first writing we have about it mentions it in about the mid-800s is the first time we start seeing reference to it. The story is, at one point, um, St. James the Greater, and he was the greater because he was the first to follow the Lord in martyrdom. He went and evangelized in Spain, uh, the old Roman province far out there. He went and evangelized there, did his mission work, came back to Jerusalem, and the, in, in um, uh, Jerusalem, the Pharisees got him, the Sanhedrin, and killed him. Okay? Well, somehow, whether through miracle or through travelers, his headless body came back to the area he evangelized. And it was at lost for a while, we're not sure, you can read about that, but someone had a vision of a field covered in stars and went and they found the casket, found the coffin with the bones in it, and miracles started happening. The field was covered with stars. It was a, a campos that's full of estrellas. Compostela is where the name comes from, okay? A field of stars. And so it has been a pilgrimage site all that time. Yeah. St. James the Greater, it's called, yes. He was. He was there. So there'd be two Jameses, James the Great and James the Less. Yeah, yeah. Could have been junior, senior, but uh, the reading that I did in preparation for this was um, uh, he was the first to follow our Lord uh, into martyrdom. Yeah, one of those would be, yeah. But the, so the, um, which one? I don't know. I think it's the other guy. Yeah. The, um, I don't think Jesus ever wanted to go to Spain back then. But the, um, um, so they've been doing this for a thousand, over a thousand years, making this pilgrimage. We don't have something like it. The whole thing of a pilgrimage, which is a retreat, but it's a moving retreat. And it's usually not moving in luxury. Okay. It's not moving in luxury. So you can do a pilgrimage to carry, get in your car, take off to carry. But it's not quite the same as these ancient ways where you're walking a distance and you're doing it kind of a miniature of your life, going from this world and this life to that next life. And all the, the with God, all the lessons you learn by doing that, lighten your pack, don't argue, stick to the path, don't take shortcuts, you know, all those things, watch your feet, okay? All those things come to play in our spiritual life. So uh, a pilgrimage is our life in miniature um, uh, as a walking retreat. And so I don't know if we have anything like it here in the US. The, um, let me dive into it. What I'm going to be going through mostly is just my slides. And, um, and it works. That's the first victory tonight, OK? <laughs> it works. Uh, what is the pilgrimage trail? What is this thing, this spiritual retreat that you can watch and see, um, uh, that you can go on. It is, let me see, there it is. Oh, it's only going one direction now. So there it is. It is from, it's all over Spain. Hmm. Padre, it's not, it's not letting me go back. Can I hit the, the back arrow, you think? Let me try it. There it is. Woo. -hoo. Okay. So this is just France and the Low Countries. Um, it's all over. It's coming from all over these. There's a pilgrimage route from Berlin. I met a guy, Ko. Ko is a South Korean soldier. He's coming from Oslo. Now, he started in Oslo with 70, we would call it, it was about 70 kilograms, which is about 130 pounds. South Korean soldier in the primo condition of life. He was an athlete's athlete. And he, he walked down. He made his own Camino in some places. But there's all these ways. The big ones coming from Lupuy and up here into France. Uh, as you see across Spain, every major city has a Camino route. And they're trying to develop even more, OK? Uh, we'll talk about why. The main one and the ancient one is from St. John and that other uh, Samport all the way to Santiago de Compostela. 
And so that's an artistic one. I've got that right here. I'm not touching it because I want to get it framed and all, but that's, it's beautiful. If you want to touch it, go ahead. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's cartoonist, but it shows you all the huge cathedrals. They have cathedrals there that we would take this entire complex and put them inside. Okay, That's just amazing, just beautiful. And then this, some weird stories, Santo Domingo, another Santo Domingo. There's like four of them in this area with the two chickens. Some, some guy was, uh, uh, he was condemned to death unjustly. His parents went to go intercede for him. And the king at the time said, well, no, he's dead as a doornail. I'll believe he's still alive. He was in the prison. I'll believe he's still alive if my chicken begins to crow. <laughs> and so in that church, they have live chickens in the church. Okay, they really do. They said that's a sign of a miracle, people. Okay, so it's like whoa. The, the, all the pair, the um, the young, at least on the Camino, the young. If you see a young person, college age, plus or minus twenty, uh, they're there for the Camino. Uh, so, and this is it. This is in uh, Spanish, but this is where you're going through all these different regions uh, of this. This area right here from Burgos, the orange, is called La Meseta. Kind of, it's not really desert, but there's no shade, there's no water, there's no little stores to buy coffee at. <laughs> you had to bring everything with you. And this is your goal. This is Santiago de Compostela, uh, a church built on top of a church, built on top of a church. The relics of St. James are there, and you go to, where else can you see relics, right? There's no relics of an apostle here, I believe, not permanent in the United States. So people have been going to have his relics and bring their intercession to him um, for over a thousand years. And so here are the relics of other, other um, apostles. Most of them are in the east, but with Peter and then Santiago, uh, Saint Santiago James the Great. And somehow Pablo, Saint Paul, got over there in Spain also. Uh, so this is a peregrino, a peregrino, a pilgrim. It's so strange. We think, when we think of pilgrims, we think of Thanksgiving. The pilgrims, okay, coming out of um, England to have religious freedom, except for you Catholics. So um, <laughs> it's a walking tour, and there is certain signs to show people that you're a pilgrim. One of them is that shell. What's the deal with the shell? The, um, the Concha, or the shell, scallop, this is the universal symbol. And you'll see it whether without the, the cross or with the cross. And there's a couple theories what happened was this would have been used at some times for penance. And your priest would say, whoa, for what you did, you got to go to Santiago. Now, a priest in Spain, that would just be an irritation. But imagine if you're in Berlin or Paris. For what you do, for your penance, I want you to go to Santiago. And when you come back, I'll give you absolution. How do you know I went to Santiago? Pick up one of these because the fish industry is huge there, fish seafood. And so pick up one of these because it's so close it'll be sold in Santiago. And so a uh, good capitalist jumped on that and they started selling these almost immediately <laughs> all over the place. Okay, So then it became just a sign you're on pilgrimage to, Com to Santiago. Um, the, then that's where the credentials, everywhere you stop, every they call them a hostel. Okay, first time I heard that, I thought, are they hostile? Is it, is it an adjective or is it a place? You have a passport, a piece of paper uh, that looks just like a passport, and they put stamps on it. Every time you stop to, to sleep, every place, the hostel you stay at, they're also called albergues, but a hostel, uh, there's like six different levels. So in, in some places, you can stay in a three, four-star hotel. Hilton, Marriott, they're all over some of the big cities. Um, and then you can stay in a place that if you're just kind of a normal person, you are probably come out with bed bugs, OK? <laughs> so uh, there's not too many, but th they work out. Because if word gets out there's bed bugs, it will destroy the industry. So they really do work on it. But I, I didn't run into them, but some people I was with did at one place. There's about 300,000 people coming on a Camino. Uh, last year, it was about 270. They think it's 300,000 this year. Of course, some people out there may have different hygiene standards. Uh, but, so this is the passport, and they'll stamp it. And so everywhere you go, you get one. You need two a day for the last 100 kilometers. And at Santiago, at the final place, they'll look at this, and they'll see the dates, and they'll make sure you actually did the hike.
Okay? And then you get, uh, as we'll see at the end, your Compostela, your certificate that you've completed it. But that's what they look like. Uh, the, there is the shells. You can see those all over the place. Most people, mine was like that. It's hanging, and it's just a, a symbol that I am on, um, uh, I am on pilgrimage. What's the churches? So the big thing you run into, especially as Catholics, is the churches. A stinky little church would have a magnificent exterior. This was a sixth century church. They put cement on top of it to keep the outline of it. But it's a sixth century church. It's incredible. It's like, wow, we didn't have American Indians back then. You know, the, 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 a lot of American Indians only came about, the ones we know, when the Spanish let loose their horses. Okay, So um, this is like, wow, uh, knowing that Roman Saint, uh, Caesar Augustus and I think Trajan, could be Tacitus, one of those two, invaded Spain along that, that pilgrimage route. We walked on Roman roads a lot. And so here is a wonderful church, just gorgeous. The symmetry of it, the size. There is an adult woman right there. You see that? She's halfway up that pole. The size of it. Inside here, as you can say in your Western Civ class, there's stories and stuff. So you're walking by this all the time. There is a small little one, okay? Just a small little thing. I met a priest, and every little town had a little church like this, okay? And I asked the priest, so how many churches? The first time I ever asked it, I said, how many churches, how many parishes do you guys do? Thinking like ours, you know, Portsmouth has, what, three guys doing seven churches right now down in Portsmouth, seven parishes. Uh, Harchie, Father Mike, if he's still there out in Perry County, has four. He and one other guy has four. And this guy goes, oh, 14. So 14, I met a guy that had 20. The most I ever met was 22. 22 parishes. I said, how do you do that? He goes, Sunday Mass. When I go there, it's Sunday. And the whole town, the whole town closes down, and they always, he only does Sunday Mass. Yeah, he works on one homily a week. That's it, okay? <laughs> By the end of the week, it'll be really good, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's some guy looking in. There. We had to do that a lot. There was a lot of places. The priest was not around, of course, and you look in to see what it's like. That's a famous one, early roots of that, pre-1000. Uh, very much it's architecturally. I think the Knights Templar were involved with that. Knights Templar, Knights of Malta were all involved in this area a little bit. Because during the Reconquest, when the Christian force, the Catholic forces, were trying to take back um, the peninsula, Iberian Peninsula, from the invading Moors, they would build castles. So we saw castles, and the Knights Templar were given some time when, I think when they were disbanded, the um, uh, Knights of Malta and the Knights of St. John of Santiago, uh, a group that was formed there, took over all their castles and stuff. And next year, that's just the front of the church. The rest of it is gone, uh, destroyed a century ago, but gorgeous exteriors. The thing about that is most of that is just one piece of stone. Imagine that artwork, the craftsmanship to go into that. Another one, beautiful, multiple years got into it. That's what they, I took a tour and they said, oh yeah, this is 11th century, this is 12th, this is 14th. The economy wasn't good back in the 13th. And they, they'd add on to it every year, okay? So they're living, they're living things. They grow with the faith of the people. And that's one, I'm outside there, okay? That's me pretty early on. Uh, the fuzz is just starting. Um, so an ancient Roman tower, okay, that was incorporated into the church. You can see a Roman arch behind it. But what this is neat, inside there, look at that statue. <laughs> that guy's holding his head, okay? Imagine what you could ask your people to do if one of your statues had that. You know, I want you to give more money. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was awed. It's way out in the front. I forget, it's St. Firminian or something like that. I'm like, wow, what do they, what do they do, you know? Um, that's the inside of a church. Just gorgeous. Gold. So you look inside a church like that one the guy was looking in, and all of a sudden you see what we call the rarados, where the tabernacle, that's the rarados. And that's what you see. Mass is being said there. There's more statues on this thing than entire dioceses in some place in the U.S., you know? So look at that. That's another one. That's a side altar. 
Look at the beauty. And so I, some guy, I said, what do you tell your people about the statues and stuff? And he said, these are saints in glory. And if you stick with the Lord Jesus, you are going to be yelling out to the guy across the way. You know, you're going to be yelling out to him in glory also. He says, that's why we've got beautiful churches. I got into it. I put it on the website. One guy said, why don't we just sell all this and give the money to the poor? Come on, let's do that, the poor. And I said, what a great idea. That's awesome. But why start with something that's being used by people? Why don't we go to the Prado in Madrid, the Prado Museum? Half those paintings there no one really cares about, you know? Why don't we sell that? I go, why don't we go to the New York Met Museum? Why don't we sell all those paintings? I bet if you cut up the Eiffel Tower into one-foot sections, people all over the world will buy it, and we could actually give, we could give like pre-debit cards to all the poor. Wouldn't that be better? And he said, I get your point. I go, so don't, don't give me this sell off the church's holdings so we can give debit cards to all the poor. Nah, the church, that's not what the church is about. This inspires people who have means to give their life to God or they won't have a niche in heaven, okay? It also inspires poor people who could be tempted to use their energy to get to meet their needs in sinful ways. It says, if I stick with the Lord Jesus and don't do sin, I'm going to have some people looking at me 500 years from now. So we got into it, and by the end of the conversation, the Spanish guy, Juo, great guy, a lawyer. This is a stinky little church. This is a nothing little church. Look at that ceiling. And look at how many statues, the stories you could tell with all of those statues, all those biographies, men and women being put before you. Ooh, back. Oh, strike one. Strike two. Nope. There's another beautiful one. Uh, I think everything I've got here is on the website, the St. Patrick's website, if you look up El Camino. So Gaudi, an artist, a designer, made a castle in the city of Astorga. And this is his castle. They say, I didn't get to do the tour of it, but you can see this is the bishop's mansion. Look what he did with those, those two doors. So probably modern art of sort. Nope. Strike two. There it is. So what's the trail like? What's actually the trail? We would get up, and at sometimes you hear someone wake up at 4.30. That's like, what are you getting up at 4.30 for? Because if we, one person gets up, y'all do. There may be a room like this with eh, 30 bunk beds in it. Men and women together. Everyone was respectful. There was nothing really untoward. People were worried about that. No, everyone's pretty respectful. Um, the, um, they're trying to preserve modesty and stuff. And so um, you'd, get to, you'd wake up in the morning. You'd already packed your bag the night before. If you didn't, you would make all the crinkling sounds that drove everybody nuts. Like, <laughs> OK? And you packed your bag the night before, put on your shoes, grabbed everything, got outside, and then did all the work of lacing up your shoes and getting, getting things going. I hiked for about two hours and then had breakfast. We'll get to that when there's food. But what's the trail like? So this is the very first night uh, we stayed in this. This is an old monastery. Um, was well, Like I said, once a Benedictine monastery, maybe Cistercian. Um, and that sign was outside the front of it. So S Santiago de Compostela, 790 kilometers. We'd already hiked like a death march of 30 kilometers to get here, OK? My feet are absolutely killing me. I'm in sandals there. Santa with socks, after a while, you don't care. Wear sandals with socks. Um, the, my feet were killing me because we just went over the very first hill to get to this town called Roncevalle. That's where this is. And it was, the worst, it was the worst mountain of all of them. Most people stopped going on that mountain. It's like six hours straight up, and then another three hours straight down. So um, very tough, but you're glad you get there. Yeah, I'm kind of in a daze. That white shirt, that white shirt is my sunscreen. I saved weight, OK? So that white shirt, you'll see it's on me constantly. I didn't even bring it to the US. It, it was so nasty looking, I just threw it out. Yeah. And what you do is, on the trail, you follow the fletches. Follow the yellow arrows. These yellow arrows point the way. This is a universal symbol. It's, it's based on the conch shell. You see, it's based on that shell. And that's pointing. Uh, we thought that the lines are pointing towards Compostello. And then we found out, nope, not at all. 
follow the yellow arrow. So someone put a lot of money and made tons of these pylons uh, that help you. After a while, they have how many kilometers you're left. Uh, 10K, 10 kilometers is six miles. That's how I, I did the math in my head. Uh, and so those, that's what you're looking for. Follow the fletches. That tells you where to go. Sometimes I'd be there and I'd find up, you'd see it. You get up at 5 a.m., it's total dark. You have to use a flashlight to find out where you're going. And I'd see the, the arrow and you start going and maybe 45 minutes later, and I had, I had a mailman's pace. So my pace I found out was really quick, okay? And um, the, um, I'm like, I don't see any arrows. I don't see any arrows. Oh my golly, what should I do? And then it's like, ding. Well, where did the last arrow say you should go? Well, this way. And I'm thinking, well, then keep following that arrow. What do you got to do? Have an arrow every foot, you know? And so it was a major lesson of just remember, follow the arrows. And if you don't have a new arrow coming, then follow the last one you heard about. There's an arrow. So this is in Galicia. That symbol, if you can see it, their symbol is the Eucharistic mass held up at the great elevation. That's the symbol of their state in Spain. Wow, what, uh, what in, ingrained Catholicism. Arrows, and there's an example of a path. And so here's a path, someone with a hiker. So it's woodland fields. We would eventually hike down there and get way down there. Uh, I stayed at this. This is a hostel. It's a replica of a ninth century hostel. They rebuilt it right on the, the grounds. Uh, that was very good. I ran into some very noisy uh, Portuguese men. They're really noisy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was terrified of bugs, but there were none. Okay? That's an ancient Roman bridge. Roman bridges sometimes they have a nice arch, and sometimes they're like an upside down V. Yeah. Oh, well, there was another one, but at, at night. Uh, so through forests with greenery. Sometimes in some places you'll be walking, it's flat as a board. And all of a sudden, as you get closer, a town will emerge because it's down in a little valley. And that's what this was. Uh, some old town, the very, over and over, the very first thing you see are the churches. Saying, hey, look at the view. Incredible view out there. Two gals walking the trail. The, um, the trail it was, because all of Spain is concerned about it, and it's way out in the middle of nowhere. It's not near a real big party city. It's about five hours from part of it to Madrid. It was very safe. And I've heard multiple people say it's very safe for single women to walk on, OK? Here, if you go out at 11 PM to a bar, you're going to deal with the, no the noise and the ruffians. Um, over in Spain, because they start eating at 9 PM, if you go out to a pub at 11 PM, you're going to deal with the roughhousing of the children, OK? I'm not kidding. They're there till midnight. Okay, so you're there with families at 11 p.m. However, if you do do it, if you go and uh, did it, and you're out to 11, you're, you will be a disaster to hike the next day. It'll, you'll just be miserable. You got to worry, every, after you're done after every day, you have to worry about rebound and, and getting healed. So this is a great site. It's in the movie. Uh, it's a national monument. That, I'm not sure who that gal was, but just stayed in for the picture. And I said, oh, yeah, come along. And... Um, <laughs> They put all these big symbols up there. A lot of windmills. This was gorgeous. Place, one of the two places I got lost. I took, I took something off to the right, went 100 yards, and had to double back. I was with about 20 other people. And you know, very, 10, 10, 15 yards out, 20 yards out, someone starts going, this isn't the way. This isn't the way in Spanish, you know. My Spanish got really good. And then 30 <laughs> yards out, the crescendo was higher. And 100 yards out, this is not the way. And everybody turns around and starts going. We didn't follow the guy who led us there. We didn't follow him again. <laughs> but isn't that beautiful? Those are the sights. Yeah. A uh, group of uh, different ages, you see, all eating. And then this, this is a water fountain. In the middle of nowhere, you'll find this, a little park. And you go there, it's potable water. They put on it, potable or not, OK? And so there was only one time when I went up to a place, and I was just about to do it, because I was really thirsty. And uh, they said, no, no potable water. Don't, it's, we cannot guarantee this, this san the, the sanity, what am I thinking? The, so the sanitation of this, and I'm thinking that's all I need. You know, come down with amoebic dysentery or something. The, um, but these were all over the place, and they were just lifesavers. You probably lose 
from one to two liters, you know, on Nalgene bottles, two liters, you probably lose from one to two of those in sweat a day um, when carrying a pack in hot weather. So here, this is over a Roman bridge, okay? <laughs> that bridge was built in the 400s and kept up over the years, but that's a Roman bridge, and we hiked across it. My camera went black for a few moments, black and white. Isn't that neat? That was a forest. I don't know how to do that. I don't know what I did. <laughs> yeah, you know, someone's going to say it's one of Pulitzer. I don't know how to do it twice. Because you know? <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Look at that. Isn't that like out of The Hobbit? Yeah, that's the path. It's a dirt path. It's been packed down. As they said, they think this year there'll be 300,000 hikers on it. And so that's been packed down. It's rock hard, but it's dirt. Now, this is what we just walked up. We came from way over there, and we walked up that mountain. I remember as I was walking up, I was going, please, please, don't, don't go up that mountain. Don't go up that mountain. No, let's go around it. I can make, I can get around it. Come on. And I think they went, there's a, there was a castle up there from the Reconquista, and we went down here somewhere, but you can see it eventually would come right here. That's the path we just did. It was a killer of a climb. And that's where we're going. And we're going all the way to the horizon. And that's the path right there, off into the horizon. Yeah. So you'd see that all the time. There's another shot. I mean, that's in just another valley, little hidden town down there. There would always be a little, they call them tienda store, and they would sell fresh fruit and coffee and pastries. They had pastries like um, croissants that were filled with chocolate. So that was just standard, OK? And then about a week into it, we met this guy named Ko, the soldier. And old Ko would have a two-liter bottle of Estrella. The, na the name of the beer is Estrella. He'd have a two-liter bottle of Estrella beer starting at 8 AM every other hour, OK? He was, and, and I said, I said, Ko, what's the deal with that? He, we just spoke in partial sentences. He didn't, we don't know what his name was, but he's from Korea, K-O. So we just called him Ko because we didn't, couldn't pronounce his name. Okay? So um, we said, what's the deal with the beer? Come on, guy. You're, like, you're, you're an incredible athlete. What's going on with that? He goes, it's carbohydrates, and I'm carb packing for the day. I'll burn this off by tonight. And his pack was really, I'm not kidding, really heavy, about twice the size of mine. That's my pack, and that's the weight of it when I started. You can feel free to pick it up. Well, I don't the gentleman in the red shirt. Your name is? Andy, would you go pick that up and tell us, light or heavy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So from that moment on, when I put that up and started walking up, I was getting rid of stuff. I got rid of some delightfully expensive stuff because I didn't need it. I got rid of the second half of my pants. You know the kind you zip off? <laughs> Every ounce counts, OK? I got rid of that. Oh, man. Um, but Ko, I said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm carb packing. It's vitamin B. He called it vitamin beer. And he says, after a while, you can't feel your feet. <laughs> Ko, Ko would be plagued with blisters the entire way. And it's like, get rid of your shoes. If you get rid of your shoes and get new ones, that means you're breaking in new shoes. You're sure to get blisters. So he was just stuck with it. Okay? He, would, he was one of the guys that would get go into every other town, go into the pharmacy. So there's pharmacies all over. There's equipment stores all over. And he would buy a thing of Vaseline, and he would just cake his feet with Vaseline every morning. He says, it feels great. It feels weird, but it doesn't feel like a blister. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, yeah. Desperation move. It's a desperation move. But that's, that picture is what we saw. Yeah. Uh, rocky roads, this looks an awful lot like some of the old Roman roads. I bet it is. But in the best condition, they'll look like that. And then who'd you meet? The people on the community. I've already seen some. Families. There's a lot of families. I met one guy. He's a Spaniard from down south somewhere. He had a trike baby buggy thing. And he's pushing his little two-year-old in there. And his four other kids and mom we're out scouting, going at different paces, and he's pushing them over that first mountain. He's doing the whole thing. I mean, some things, you're, you're rocking up a gully uh, with rocks. Rocks, no, they're no smaller than this big. And he's going to push his youngster the whole way up. It's awesome, OK? Just amazing to see that guy doing it. He might be doing it, which I think a lot of people do, in sections. You got a week? Go do 100 kilometers. You'll be done with it in five weeks, five years, two years, whatever you want. So a lot of people do it in sections. 
uh, family group, church group. Uh, that lady walking looks like a lot. We were walking by the highway. That's actually pretty tough when it's very hard or when you're actually walking on blacktop. Man, that was you're just swapping your feet. So I'm still not back to my normal walk that I was in July. My feet took a beating. So if I'm walking out to Mass and you see me going like this, it's because I'm that close to going, ah! <laughs> so there's probably a deep bruise or something. I'm just praying it's a deep bruise and I'll get beyond it, you know. But um, now look at this. You see that town, Poblacion de Campos? Look at the population. Three. <laughs> Okay, carrion. That, that's not carrion like we understand carrion. That, that word means something different over there. Okay, it's, it's not dead meat. Uh, Eighteen, and so we met some towns that were starting to come back to life because of the Camino. Remember, three hundred thousand people every night. They're going to be spending ten to twenty euros every night, and you're going to get a section of those three hundred thousand people coming to your city. It's, it's starting to rejuvenate economically northern Spain, and so yeah, happy camper. And then this is a day, so you get signs, you were always looking for the Fletches, okay? And this is a day I had a, a choice uh, between the Camino Frances and uh, the Camino Frances would go off to the hard left and this calzada, the Roman path, that's where the calzada was. I thought it was a kind of food, okay? And so, and it's the Roman path. It's where um, Caesar Augustus went to attack someone it's where another Trajan with the seventh legion who started the town of Leon, they got that from legion, okay? Legion, Leon. Um, they went to make sure that the gold mines of northern Spain were connected back to Rome. And so they sent an army up there and they, they walked the same way. And so it looks like, I was looking for a thing, that's what it looks like. The Roman path looks just like that, okay? Only with bigger and less structured stones. It just, it was like, it hurt. Okay, And so after a day of walking, you get done at 12, 1, 2, or 3, and you go to a place called the Hostel or an albergue, and I said there's six levels um, of, of grandeur in most big cities, you know, a real nice place. But this would be a communal room, and so I went to the Benedictine nuns, and they had rooms of about, I think there were four of us. So it was a family, three people from a family, and me in a room, just single beds, and down the hall you had a men's shower, um, laundry, you do your laundry by hand. Every day you stop, you get showered, you get cleaned up, you clean, do your laundry by hand or machine, and put it out to dry, and then start thinking rest, re re recuperation, and food. And so that was, the, that was the schedule for every day. So the sisters, we ran into their holy hour. Sisters behind a screen having a holy hour. We just walked right into it. It's like, <gasps> and most of the crowd I was with that day was like, whoa, what is this? I'm like, get on your knees, you know? <laughs> so this is, I think the sisters like that. And that's a not very nice one, albergue, a hostel. And this is one, had about five beds and very nice. Whoever did this would, had a potpourri thing with a vanilla smell. So the whole house smelled like vanilla. <laughs> After being out with cows, we're in cow country, there's evidence of cows all over the place, evidence of sheep. After being at that, to walk into a place that was like that, wonderfully clean, uh, that was a joy. Uh, there's me getting ready for mass, and another one, and those are some bunk beds behind me. I remember that one, because there was some very, very loud Italians, okay? <laughs> the nationalities come out like crazy, and so, <laughs> Would you like another cracker? And it's like, I'm gonna give you, it's 11 at night, I'm gonna give you a cracker, mister. Would you stop it? And I was like, what are you doing, you know? But everyone's, everyone's kind, and that's a big one. One of the largest is in Santiago. I think it has 800 beds. It's gigantic, okay? So this one I stayed in, I had the lower bunk, very nice. I had earplugs every night because there were at least one or two snores in every group. And this is what you do, you come in and you take off your shoes because the shoes have been walking through all that stuff and they don't want that where your bare feet's gonna be. So this is uh, one place after, I don't know, 50, 60 shoe, pairs of shoes. There's my laundry, thought I'd let you see that. All my socks, because I was changing my socks two to three times a day. Um, blisters start with water, friction, and time. And so if you get rid of the water, by changing your socks and, get, and letting your feet dry out in the air, you didn't get blisters. So I had blisters on my little toes 
really because they got crunched up into the front of the foot when you're going down. Uh, and then I didn't have blisters again. Okay, they got people I was living with, that I was walking with, a guy named Owen and Rory, brothers from Ireland. Uh, Owen had terrible deep blisters. You know those deep blisters that get skin and they're like you're mining for tissue? And Rory, just his bottom of his feet were just a solid blister. He decided to do this without any preparation. Okay, so it's like, Rory, what do you think, man? You know, but he loved it. He'll be coming back. He just loved it. He loved the time of it. But yeah, his feet, because they did not have uh, the socks. So I had a silk liner and an outer wool sock to get the friction away from your foot. So your friction, the friction's with the sock, it's not with your feet. There's a whole science behind it. And the food, as we get close. Ah, uh, the food. So this was a, a, a Olympian soup. Uh, made with egg, and the main part of it is bread. They'll put bread in the water and boil it with bread right in it. I'm not sure, have you ever heard that? Anybody? I haven't done it, you know. It was delicious. Um, then a ham, that's their ham, eggs of course, potatoes, potatoes on everything. Um, this is about 8 a.m. in the morning. I had stopped uh, to get a, and that was the meal right there. I, I picked up bananas like crazy. Probably <laughs> ate two, three, four bananas a day. And the, I, I got the idea because I was watching Wimbledon. I don't, like 10 seconds turn, you know, just a few seconds of it. And Roger Federer, in between sets, would eat bananas. And I'm thinking, if it's good enough for Federer, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Okay. So I was eating bananas, and when I found out, that's actually really good for you, okay? So I did that, some little, ch there you go, some little ch crunchy chocolate thing. Uh, that part of Spain, definitely Astoria, is the, is the chocolate capital of Spain. So you gotta have chocolate any time you can. And cafe con leche, coffee with milk. I don't do coffee with milk over here, but over there you're trying to get anything you can, and so I did. And I would always go in saying, you know, coffee over there is European coffee. It's that little thing. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's gone. Okay? It's like, where'd it go? It's like, where's the coffee, you know? So I would go in saying, and, un café con leche el más grande posible. The largest possible, okay? So uh, I was getting that. Um, this is very typical breakfast, okay? Um, some cheese, some ham. Prosciutto was big, eggs, I could live on eggs. This stuff, which is the same up there, it's, they called it a tortilla. That's a tortilla in Spain. It's, I think, it strikes me as a potato quiche, okay, with maybe without a crust or something. Uh, paella, my mom would make paella and she would make it, it would be mostly seafood stuff with a few grains of rice. This was the other, I loved it. I just loved it, you know, now that I looked at it, because this is the authentic thing. And it, this was a vegetarian, very little seafood. And then they do things like this. Uh, this would be a croquette, a hard piece of bread. And these would be mushrooms uh, with prosciutto underneath it, smothered in some type of cheese. It's del it was delicious, okay? So that's the stuff, now that'd be about that big. That's the stuff that tapas and pinchos are made of. And I asked one guy, what's the difference? And he said, well, it's different all over the place. But in generally, pinchos have a presentation, and they're more expensive. Tapas are the free things a bar gives you, a pub gives you, to have you invite your friends. And so I'd gone to a place to have a, uh, a drink, a beer, and um, they came around giving me, not like this, but bread with maybe jam or bread with meat and cheese on it, and they just said, we'd like some, and I'd take one, and, and that was a tapas. So when we say tapas bar or tapas restaurant, uh, it's a little different than that, okay? Though they, we do have chocolate, Astorga, the chocolate capital of Spain, and that bar right there, that is about an inch and a half thick. Ah, oh, it was great, you know? <laughs> it was just awesome, yeah. I wanted to bring it home, I had some home for you. It didn't make it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make it to the plane, okay? <laughs> uh, then this. So this is an Astorga. This is a street. It is lined with little cafes and little restaurants and stuff. And this is churros y chocolate. And so that is melted chocolate bars. And you take these stick thingies that are, they can be chewy in the middle, like a chewy cookie, you know, those cookies that are bendable. Or it can be real crunchy, and you dip it in. And the last person who you take turns, and the last person 
I, they, they could have just made this up for me, who gets the dip, um, they have to drink all the chocolate, the last one. It's like, oh, it was great. So, <laughs> Uh, more food. So this whole thing. So there's the drink. A lot of fruit. You could get fresh orange juice. They all had machines that you put orange ju oranges in it, and out on the other side comes freshly squeezed orange juice. All the places had that. Um, the um, salads were everywhere. These sandwiches. So it's a two hunks of bread with a piece of meat on it and maybe a uh, tomato in it, and then of course octopus. Anyone had octopus? Oh, it's wonderful. It's just great. If, it, if, if you think it grosses you out, don't look at it, just taste. Yeah. <laughs> but that was wonderful. And they always serve it on wooden plates like that. And then this was just, uh, again, this would be a, uh, from a, a tapas bar, a little croquette of, of um, some bread uh, with cream cheese over it and maybe some um, blueberry jam or something like that and some a chicken uh, whatever that thing is, yeah. yeah. Hunks of chicken that were fried and stuff, yeah. And then, so you always eat in groups. I was always eating with groups, whether you understood them or not. Sometimes you go off on your own, but you could if you want to. You could always eat with a group. And then this was our staple. That's what I'm talking about. One or two pieces of prosciutto on a, a, a submarine sandwich. And I don't know how you do it, but the crust was always very hard. It's a, I think you take it, put water on it, and put it back in the oven, and it makes the crust harder. They loved that stuff, so it was always very crunchy. So that and some uh, vitamin B. <laughs> Here's another one. That was a normal, that was a lunch on a Sunday. I had that on uh, one Sunday. Um, and that is from a tapas bar. You'd go in there and say, I'd like that, I'd like this other thing, whatever you want. Again, bar, you go up there and you point to what you want. And they'll, they'll ask you how many, and you can, if you don't speak, you go to that. And they know what you're doing. They're used to it. So that'd be shrimp, some green peppers, and a whole bunch of different seafoods. And that's, I did that a couple times, sitting right at the bar. And they are providing whatever beverages you want, wine, wa uh, beer, water, lemonade. They had a, a Tinto, Vino Tinto, which is 50 red wine and 50 lemonade. Oh, was it, it was really good. Okay. On a hot day, yeah, Oof. And yet again. So those are really a, a great memory, the uh, tapas and pinchos. Uh, Kanya is a little thing, okay? Two euros. So when I came to Toronto, I was used to the, the beer being pretty um, cheap. And I came to Toronto, 11 bucks. For something that big, I'm like, I'm not having beer again, you know, forget that. That'll be the day I pay that much. Uh, so that is what Co would order, okay? He would order one of these giant things. There's actually one between this, it's about half of that. He would order one of those every, every morning. And then every time he stopped, that was his beverage. <laughs> There's me, after a long morning hike, you can see the band from my hat. I didn't let the sun touch me. I didn't need the sun doing anything else. Uh, and look at that size of that cafe con leche. That was a great one. <laughs> it's just bread with prosciutto on it, like one or two layers thick of prosciutto. That's all it is. There was no, what's ketchup? You know, mustard is some real fancy thing from Germany. You put on uh, sauerkraut or something, but yeah. And so that's what this was for. If you followed, I, every time I would go somewhere, I would show you where I was with a little dog print for the little, the little, you know, a Dominicane, right? Black and white Dominicane, <laughs> God's junkyard dogs, uh, the little hiker from Hobby Lobby, and uh, this thing. One of our prisoners, if you know who it is, gave me one of these little wobble thingies. And that's supposed to be me, but has far too much hair. <laughs> so, and, so it, it was equivalent, with all the talk of food, it was equivalent to walking, to going to a gym for seven hours a day. So I lost about, I walked for 29 days, and I lost 35 pounds. So I've had a doctor say, that's too much. He says, back off, because I still like walking. I'm trying to still walk. Um, so I got there. There I am at Santiago. Woohoo! <laughs> So, did it. And <laughs> I did it, okay. The, um, so what are the lessons? Now, someone said within a year, they said, really, you're gonna, 
it, within a year, you're going to come up with lessons? I said, well, there's some immediate lessons. But as far as it being life-changing, they said, in a year, you'll see how it was life-changing. But immediately afterwards, it, maybe it was life-changing in you know, how much my feet were hurting or something. You know? Don't do that again. The last week, I was always, for the first Monday through Friday, I did 35K or more every day. And my last day, I did 46K, 48K. So that's four 10K races and six tenths of a 10K race. So, and why? I think I just said, get it done. I really think I got into, Lord, get this done. It was a great time of prayer, of interceding for all the families. I had it on my phone, the list of our parish, and interceding for every family. Um, and some families got more vehement prayer. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, help them too. Okay? <laughs> so, the, uh... And so... What are some lessons? You yellow arrows, follow the arrows, follow the fletches. You gotta do the fletches. That's your direction, stick to the fletches, the first lesson. And in our life as Catholics, fletches are acts of charity. If you get to do an act of charity, do it, jump on it. It's also your vocation. Your vocation is the direction to go, it's your fletcher. okay? I met people who were married and they're saying, oh, I wonder what God wants me to do today. I bet it's on your to-do list. That's the creator of the universe wants me to get those dishes done over in the kitchen. Yeah, follow the Fletches. It's so simple. On the Camino in our life, the Fletches are acts of charity. If you get a chance, jump on it. And it's our vocation. It's the duties of our state in life. So the first lesson is follow the Fletches, the arrows. Follow those arrows. And that is charity and your vocation. Second, pack. Oh my golly, that pack. Like I said, I started with that pack way too much. We carry too much on that trail. I did. We have to get rid of stuff. And that is the same emotionally in our memory, psychological baggage. If I'm on the trail and I'm thinking, oh my golly, I remember those blisters I had 100 kilometers ago, you know, 70 miles ago. I remember those blisters. They were bad. Oh my God, they were bad. That's crazy. Give it up. Let it go. It's in the past. And so every one of us, if you have someone or some event that's a blister in your past, let it go. You got too much to go for. Be free of it. Get rid of it. Also, stuff. We generally tend to have too much stuff. And so look and see, can I simplify? Life is easier when you have less things, material things. Because we're material, uh, I forget what, the, what writer said. This may have been Romano Guardini. He said, because we're material, we find our comfort in the material world more than in the spiritual world. He says, so try to reverse that. God wants to. Okay. Um, see if you can get rid of some stuff. That's a great lesson from the Camino. Walking with others. Walk with others when you can, especially experts, especially people who know. We had a guy named Juo. Uh, he's from Portugal, a lawyer, in between jobs. Most people were in between jobs. Not much faith at all. And um, he, um, he spoke English perfectly and Spanish and Portuguese. And so he was kind of like an expert. And he'd done the Camino before, so he was letting us know where to stay. And he was an expert. It just makes sense to go with people that are know-how. Who do you have in your life who's an expert in some area that you go to? Most Americans don't. We're very isolated. And so that's not a good way to do the Camino, OK? So older brothers and sisters in Christ, the saints and angels, are you, are you wrestling with what the saints have to say, OK? How they say to follow Jesus. They're the experts, OK? So confront them. Go with older brothers and sisters in the Lord. Have some expert you can go to uh, in your life. Like I said, a lot of people don't. Next, the guidebook. I didn't bring it. It's up in my room somewhere. <laughs> Probably wasn't packed away. We had to consult the guidebook constantly, OK? Even though there was stuff we had to know what's coming up, plan, how far we're going to go, and all that stuff. And so the Bible and our catechism are the guidebook in our pilgrimage in this life, OK? You got to consult them daily. The guidebook of the Bible is, the, is God himself speaking to us. And if you're, if you're willing, he can make it jump right off the page. He can say, this was made for you. So consult the guide constantly. Last couple. Walking pole. There's my one of two. Uh, the walk, you have the walking pole, and they said uh, St. James did and other pilgrims, because when going downhill, you get these in front of you, and it saves your knees. And when going uphill, you put that tip behind you, and it pushes you like a banister rail. Okay, And so um, 
You got to have it, and partly because of the pain. Um, injury, pain, danger, suffering, it's part of the Camino. It's not, it's not outside the Camino. Dealing with that is part of the pilgrimage, dealing with that stuff. And so no one complained regarding blisters. Oh my golly, I don't believe in the Camino because there's blisters. Or they screamed, oh my golly, I have blisters. I can't believe this. They're on the Camino. Blisters are part of it. Deal with it. Come on. What, you expect you're going to be blister free on the Camino? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we're on the Camino. Okay? The Camino is our life in miniature. Pain's going to be part of it. Relational, emotional, psychological, physical, sometimes spiritual. You know it. It's going to be part of it. Don't, don't freak out over it. It's normal Catholic living on the Camino that is our life. Okay? This is the theology of suffering that I dealt with, <laughs> but meditated on, thinking about my feet and my ankles and my knees and that miserable <laughs> heavy backpack, okay? So it's just part of it. And the walking pulls to help you. What are those things that help you deal with the weight of it? Last, boots. The Camino does not walk itself. Juo uh, would always go, and there was this lady named Katia, Katia, from Moscow. She's a fashion designer. Uh, closed up one line, and I was going to be begin another, and she had time to do it. She's been in Medjugorje many times. And... Um, she would say things at dinner like, well, let's, let us all stay, join hands and do a prayer. I mean, we're all believers, right? And I'm like, whoa, Katya, no, no, this dude's an atheist. Okay, <laughs> like, you want to tick him off? You get to hold his hand, okay? But um, she was a real wonderful zealot. Well, she and one other guy would always keep saying, the Camino doesn't walk itself. You got to do it. You got to do it. And so buckle up your boots and do it. And so that's the same thing. Our daily to-do list is God's will for us. Our vocation, the chores, the duties of our state and life, those tasks. You can say, what does the creator of the universe want from me today? I should clean up my room. <laughs> That's that simple. Follow the arrows. Keep, put your boots on. Do what you're supposed to do. So your to-do list, your duties of your state and life are that important. And lastly, mountains, hills, and bumps. That first day was a mountain. That first day was just a killer. And most people quit on the first day because of that first mountain. And so, once you go over that mountain, the next day was pretty tough too, okay? They didn't let you rest. But um, you're going over the next one, eventually you get to something and you go, Pfft. compared to what we had over there, this is nothing. This is a hill. And then some guy, Kuo, did part of it, who goes, bump in road. I'm like, that's because you can't feel your feet, okay? But um, <laughs> uh, Ko, uh, but they said, this is a bump in the road. This is nothing. It's a long uphill, looks bad. On the first day, that would have been terrible. Okay, now, pff, piece of cake. Know the difference between mountains, hills, and bumps. Not everything is a mountain. Not everything is a mountain. And some of you have been through real mountains. Some of you have been through very tough things. Now, when I talk to a bunch of grade school kids about this, our, at St. Pat's, I said, and some of you have never met a mountain yet because your parents have kept you from it. God bless them. But one day you're gonna hit a mountain, and once you overcome it, it's going to set in proper order a whole bunch of other things. And there's going to be hills, and there's just going to be stinky little bumps in the road. Now, to another person, that bump in the road might be, they may think, oh my, this is a mountain. And you can say, no, it's not. It's just a bump. Get through it. It's just a bump. So not everything is a mountain. Know the difference. Know what mountains you've gone over. I think death of people we love is major mountain, OK? Struggles in faith, struggles in illness, and things like that. Those are mountains. And if you've overcome it, look where God has you. So you know, eh, this thing coming up, this is a stinky hill. Give me enough time, I'll get through this. Or it's like, Psh, this is a bump in the road. This is a piece of cake. We would think that papers and colleges were major mountains. Oh, no, I have a 25-page paper due in my philosophy class. Oh, no, that's terrible. That's a bump in the road, you know, OK? And so today's hills also prepare us for tomorrow's mountains. I really hurt that first day, okay? I, it was hard going 10K, the six-mile race. It was just hard doing that. Um, yet that last day, I did 46K, okay? And two, uh, two more kilometers after I got on, 48 day, totally. I was like, how did I do that? That's incredible. The early mountains and hills prepared me for other ones to take on. And so today's cross is preparing you for an even greater one tomorrow. Doing something and enduring something awesome today prepares you for something tomorrow. So uh, just be aware of that. Endure it. Go after it. It's worth it because there'll be something greater coming up. Not harder, just greater. Just greater. And so that's it. Buen Camino! <laughs>
want to thank Father Tom, uh, and I also want to give my own witness into just how intensely Father Tom prepared uh, for the Camino. I, I did you know, that. you'd see him go out in the morning, and then and then come back late in the afternoon and said, and he says, you know, I've been to Easton or something like, you know, <laughs> and he like walked all the way there and back. Um, so we have some time for questions. If you don't mind sticking around for another 10 minutes or so for questions, uh, we'll use this microphone not to amplify your voice, but so Uncle Tom's, uh, Uncle Tom, Father Tom's aunt can, can hear through Facebook. So did the hostels serve food? Yes. No. Uh, some of them did. Some of them didn't. Okay. Some of some of them you go there as a peregrino meal, which would be a soup, and then that that quiche thing, that tortilla, and then tons of bread. They served tons of bread, and then they would do wine. Like probably trying to kill our sense of pain. They would do a jug of wine, and so they're pretty free flowing with that. It wasn't the high end wine, but we didn't care. So they did. But normally, I would go out and just get a sandwich. I wasn't. I was exhausted. It's like, I need to get my food intake, I need to get nutrition, and then I need to get to sleep. <laughs> Thank you for giving us this uh, speech, uh, Father, very informative. Several questions I have. One of them uh, is, how many miles did you, uh, I know that there are 500. How many of those 500 did you walk? So the, um, I did probably 550. Five. Yeah. 550 yes. miles Yeah. in 29 Seven, days? That 730 was, that 730, that 790 kilometers was 30, 25 kilometers wow. into it. So that's 820. So you did all the way from the beginning to end? Yes. Wow, that's congratulations. This is great. Yeah, that's why I'm walking yeah. funny right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. I understand that uh, instead of you carrying uh, the heavy weight, you can contract someone uh, to take uh, your baggage your from baggage, place yes. to place? Yes. Uh, so what that is, is there is a, there's a whole industry. That, and there's other industries. I saw them. I didn't see them. And that's why they're waiting to be formed. Um, porta potties. Folks, there's millions to be made in porta potties in Spain. Okay? <laughs> that's what I'll let you know. But they, they had this where you take your luggage, you put five bucks in an envelope, and you get it shipped on the Ford. Now that's, I knew that wasn't what God wanted me to do, okay? Yeah. I was doing it, I had a number of spiritual facets. One of them was reparation for sins of priests, sins of ancient wow. people. So I, wow. I pretty much wanted to carry it. Wow. I wanted to make it as light as I could though. Okay? <laughs> so the $40 yeah. umbrella, it was a parasol, okay? Yeah. But um, $40 umbrella, I got rid of because it, it weighed three pounds. Yeah. So you can do that, I yeah. didn't, I decided yeah. not to. One more question, I'm sure that a lot of people have questions. Uh, the last question of mine is, uh, this route, how much did you spend the, uh, from beginning to end the, so we can have bu budget? Sure, the tickets were the big one. So this, was, this is also a gift from mom and dad. Okay, my, my dear parents paid for this. Okay? So um, the, uh, I took out 200K, 200... Um, What's it done? The euros. Okay, I took out 200 euros four times, and the last one was like three days before I was leaving, and I was going to go to the Prado Museum and buy some books. So I got four or five books. Um, they're all expensive, so I think it was under a thousand euro for food, and I'm talking way under a thousand. I'm talking way, it was under 800 euros for food and drink the whole time. Yeah, and I was maxing out on water though. The the beer and the wine, the other guy's doing beer and wine. Sometimes I'd do that. I wouldn't drink like Co. He was an animal. Like he, he, had a, he, he still had a 50-pound pack on okay, But when we ended. So he was burning calories like I would never do, and he was used to it. But um, no, you could get away a, a nice meal every couple days or once a week, Sunday, nice meal in a good restaurant. Yeah, it's very easily doable, I think, under 800. 800 euros, so whatever that is in the exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if it needs that. Can't leave Father, you, you, this is a pilgrimage. Um, you spoke several times about people who are on this with you who had no faith. Mm -hmm. So, what would have been their motivation? 
It's a great question. What's the motivation of people now? I think, from what I could tell, nine out of 10 people were not doing this for faith, okay? I think about nine out of 10, okay? Uh, among my groups, I met, now maybe just because this is a Catholic thing to do, let's do it, okay? But most of it was like doing the Appalachian Trail. There's no particular reason, I gotta get this done. It's just something to do, a bucket list thing, check this off. For a lot of people, it was an athletic event because it's, it's an athletic event. You're going to the gym for 30 days, 50 days straight. Um, the, uh, there's some communion with nature. That didn't gel me, okay? <laughs> yeah, nature's beautiful, but the path is hard, you know? Um, um, <laughs> a church tour. So I tried to stop at every church and make a visit in every church that I saw. And I also wanted the stamps. I was a junkie for these things, okay? So I had two entire passports by the time I was done. Okay, you're supposed to do one. I had two of them, front and back. So um, the, um, uh, because it's, a, it's like, I remember that place. Ah, run down exterior, gorgeous interior. Just one, you know, over and over you can remember. So I got pictures from most of them. The, um, so I think most people are not doing it for spiritual reasons. I think the movie set that up. The movie The Way, because most of these people were not doing it for spiritual reasons. Now, my take on that is that it is, this is a sacramental. And so you all know people who wear a miraculous medal or a scapular or have a crucifix on their wall. Those are sacramentals. They're different than sacraments. A sacrament accomplishes, if you do what's there, it does what it's supposed to. So in your obligation to worship God well every Sunday, fourth commandment, no, third commandment, honor the Lord's day, if you go to Mass and participate to the best of your ability, go along with what's going on, you worship God well. It accomplishes what you're supposed to do. But, ex opere operantis, you have to have the proper dispositions to get anything out of it, right? It's not magic, okay? You have to have the proper dispositions to get anything out of it, to have the grace that, that should, can be there. That's what people forget. Showing up as a bump on a log in Mass yeah, you're worshiping God well. well. Well done, good, and faithful. But you're not getting anything out of it if you don't have the proper dispositions. Well, a Camino, like a medal, like this, like a rosary, those are sacramentals. And they're taking the grace, one for us in the sacraments, and applying it to our life. So there's a lot of people who are on there, and they don't have the proper dispositions. But they're on God's turf. That made me so hopeful. They're on God's turf. In a moment, they cry out, oh God, oh God, oh God. That was a lot of my prayer with those that two words over and over. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Yeah, get me through this day. Don't let my knee blow out. My knee, you know, things hurt. Just who knows why. And um, God will hear that prayer. That's the beauty of the Camino. Okay? It's arduous. It'll break people down from their trust in things of the world. And it's a sacramental, but it, it goes after you and you come to see a simpler life. You come to see a religious place. So there's so much potential for a person coming to know the Lord deeper by going on the Camino. So I had one guy who was complaining, none of them are religious at all. I'm like, I don't care. This is God's turf. And the smallest twinge of prayer in your heart, God can answer just like that. And he can make something happen. So that's why I love the Camino. It's because um, it is a religious thing, and you're on you're in God's turf. Okay, you've entered into God's country, whether you know it or not. He may meet you right around the next corner. Yeah. We have time for maybe two more questions. We'll make sure we get you. Yes. Did you say there was more than one trail? Yes, there was a lot. Okay, so you could choose which one you yeah, wanted to go Yeah, a lot on. of people did. Yes. So there's the ancient trail, which is which I think Caesar, one of the Caesars, sent one of his armies through, and that is up along Basque country and the Mediterranean Sea and the Bay of Biscay, okay? And that's supposed to be gorgeous, but it's not as developed as the main, the Camino Frances. And then every single town in Spain, all the big things, go to Valencia, spend a day at the beach, okay, when you're tired of it, hike the Camino in there, Cadiz, Seville, all of them, Madrid, have Camino paths going. They go back hundreds and hundreds of years, not as long as the original one. But they're all going, yeah. ending up at the they're same They're all place. going to Santiago, the oh. tomb of the apostle. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, was there any soft paths you, uh... There were. There were. There were some very nice soft paths. Sometimes we'd be walking, and it was like two, three hours, and it was a, it was a evergreen forest. And you're walking there, and so the paths would be evergreen um, ne needles. You know, it's like, it's like high banks. Go to high banks, a lot of paths like what we got at high banks. Um, other times, it was eucalyptus leaves. Um, they brought in eucalyptus trees back in the 40s for some reason. Someone let their pet eucalyptus go. And it's an invasive species. <laughs> yeah, can you believe it? And it's taken over. Then they love it because now it's supplying the paper industry and oils and things like that. So um, there's eucalyptus paths. And then sometimes you're walking on like walking on Broad Street, <laughs> okay? And you're just walking right on concrete or stone. So, you know, an old Roman stone. Someone was asking me, why did I take that Roman path? And I says, because I was channeling some of my ancestors. Well, there's probably a Roman there somewhere. <laughs> All right, well, I'll go ahead and uh, thank Father Blau again for this great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Father Tom, if you could give us a blessing through the intercession of St. James. Yes. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I ask you, Holy Apostle St. James, you were the first to give your life in witness to the Lord. We ask you, through your intercession, be with all of us here. Continue to pray for us on our journey. Let us hear sometime over the next few days a uh, word of encouragement of Buen Camino that you give. We ask your intercession and your protection and your strength for all gathered here. And we pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Buen Camino, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Very good. Thanks for coming out. And uh, just to put on your radar, again, we have a talk on the second Thursday of every month called Into the Deep. So that's what uh, Father, Father Tom graciously agreed to give us the, his talk to be deep for October, but stay tuned for November and, and subsequent. And if you know someone that wanted to be here and couldn't be here tonight, Susan has scheduled this talk for October 24th. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to do this again uh, right here. My pleasure. <laughs>